Hello, Penguinauts! I'm the Beardy Penguin, and welcome back to For All Kerbal Kind. Beginning the episode by unlocking the Entry, Descent, and Landing Technode, which gives us access to a plethora of small heat shields. However, we actually unlock that Technode right before the launch of Envoy 4, which is actually right at the end of 1956. And uh, you'll see why... Uh, <laughs> perhaps we should have delayed this launch because we have to propel an advanced biological capsule containing a small doggo ripped from the streets of Moscow up to 4,000 meters per second and return them safely. The return them safely part is going to be what we struggle with because it turns out, yeah, 4,000 meters per second is really pushing it when it comes to re-entry. So although we managed to complete all of the contract objectives apart from bring them home safely, uh, yeah, it turns out without a heat shield, well, this capsule is not going to survive the rigors of re-entry, and very, very unfortunately, we lose our first doggo in the name of science. Although, to be honest, with the G-forces we've been putting all of these dogs through, <laughs> I'd be very surprised if any of them survived so far. But Doggo's life will not be lost in vain. We're going to take the lessons learned and our next Envoy mission is going to put a dog into orbit, this time returning them home safely with the use of a heat shield. But in the meantime, we're going to be accepting the first navigational satellite and atmospheric analysis satellite contracts and completing both of them with Sputnik 7. This is actually the final Sputnik launch. I thought the Sputnik program should really just be experimental satellites, just as we're sort of getting to grip with the whole concept of putting things into orbit but uh, really these R8 launches especially are becoming routine at this point so in the future all of our satellite launches are going to have specific names based upon their specific actual mission profiles. But this, since, as I said, is completing two separate contracts and two very early satellite contracts, I thought it might as well just round off the Sputnik program with a bang. Or, well, hopefully not with a bang, hopefully with a nice <laughs> successful launch and no unexpected rapid unscheduled disassemblies. Regardless, the R8 performs absolutely flawlessly, as per usual. I mean, we're getting a lot of test data um, on these engines now, and the R8 is proving to be a very reliable launch vehicle. You see there, getting a little bit of talk just as we uh, deactivate the upper stage, but thankfully we managed to regain control with the help of our RCS thrusters. Then all we have to do is once again coast up to our apoapsis and then fire off our final kick stage. Now, a few people have been saying that we really should invest in solid rocket boosters, but a lot of our satellite contracts, they have very specific orbital parameters, right? They require low eccentricities, very specific um, apoapsis, periapsis heights, uh, etc. So we really need a kick stage that we can shut off at the appropriate time. So we're going to continue using this small liquid fueled kick stage. I mean, this is a 1936 rocket engine <laughs> that we're using, but it's just such a light engine that despite the fact that its ISP is in the mid 200s, um, <laughs> so yeah, not particularly great. It's so light that it doesn't really matter and it still gives us improved performance over a solid rocket kick stage, although of course it does introduce the possibility of failure since solid rockets do not actually fail in the test light mod. Regardless, pushing onwards, this is the Ha 4. Yes, finally the replacement for the Ha 3. Now, I actually designed this all the way back at the beginning of 1956, but it took all of the last year to actually design it. I was hoping to get its first flight into 1956, but it ended up being the very beginning of 1957 instead. But it doesn't really matter. We are still leagues ahead of the Amerikanskis over the pond, so we don't really have to worry too much. I mean, our HAL program has always been <laughs> way ahead of their X-Plane program. Um, so yeah, we researched hypersonic flight um, at the same time that they were going for lunar range communications, which is why they did beat us, unfortunately, to the moon with an impact program. 
probe in the previous year. But we're going to be attempting to replicate their lunar mission in this year, so we should catch up relatively swiftly. And as I said, we are way ahead of them with regard to not only human spaceflight, uh, with the half 4 but also sending animals into space as well. I mean, our actual Envoy program is, again, well ahead of theirs. So we're still way ahead of them in multiple different departments. They managed to bonk the moon. Big deal. We're going to put a satellite into orbit of the moon, and then, then we'll see who's boss. Regardless, Vladimir Kerman takes the helm on the 21st of January 1957, and he is going to attempt to be the first Kerbal to cross the Kármán line, cross the threshold from the edge of the atmosphere into outer space, and become the world's very first cosmonaut. Despite forgetting to switch on half of his scientific instruments and getting a little cooked on re-entry, Vladimir has a successful flight and we get a huge influx of funds thanks to the vast amount of milestones and contracts that we completed. For some reason we also completed the contract to uh, send an advanced biological capsule up to space and bring it back. Perhaps because we'd already achieved all the other steps apart from returning something safely from that speed. Perhaps that's why we somehow completed the contract, but uh, regardless, we're going to cancel our final R9, which we were constructing at Plesetsk, and we're going to get constructing a 60-ton pad, so Plesetsk can actually get building orbital-class rockets. In the meantime, though, we're going to fly some more flights of the H4 or Puglia. I might just continue calling it the Puglia because that's Russian for bullet. Yes, I am actually attempting to use Russian words and terms for <laughs> the names for all my different craft, but I am aware that I will be butchering many of them. But from now on, yeah, we'll refer to it by its actual name. Now, this is actually quite a special flight. We're not going to go through the Kármán line again, but we are completing the contract that actually killed Alexander Kerman. Yes, that supersonic contract. We have to maintain quite a high velocity for three minutes. However, since the Puglia is actually so capable, once we finish that contract, we can actually ascend a few kilometers and then 
push ourselves through our next crude speed record, which is actually 2,000 meters per second. Now, I think the H3 probably could have done this, um, but we never got a chance to find out because unfortunately it disintegrated. But as you can see, the Puglia is vastly superior, not only in its actual flight profile at hypersonic velocities, but also just in its thermal resilience, right? It can actually take a lot of heating. It can take flames shooting down the side without breaking a sweat. Or, well, maybe, <laughs> maybe breaking a few pieces of the aircraft. We do have a couple of explosions throughout this video, mainly just the decals on the rear landing gear though nothing actually serious ever ends up exploding and we're not actually doing any runway landings um, at all today because this is a really difficult aircraft to fly subsonic right it is designed to fly hypersonic and it flies hypersonic like a dream subsonic though it flies bit like a falling brick and it has tiny little bicycle landing gear so I'm not even going to attempt to land that thing on a runway. Regardless though we've actually finished unlocking lunar range communications which as well as giving us a more powerful antenna unlocks an upgrade for the tracking station which we're going to grab. So in combination with our mission control upgrade, we will then be able to actually plot maneuver nodes, which is crucial for getting to the moon. But in the meantime, the Americans have been busy. They have launched Explorer 6 with a large magnetometer boom, at least that is what our informants tell us. I mean, that's something we achieved ages ago, though. So regardless, when it comes to sort of low Earth orbit operations, I think we have more capable rockets, more capable launch vehicles, and frankly more capable satellites than they do. Um, but they just managed to leapfrog us to the moon, mainly thanks to, I just want to say, just a <laughs> cavalier attitude, right? They managed to use solid rocket boosters to get a lunar impact probe. Um, which is just insane. I mean, the amount of fine tuning it takes to get a lunar impact trajectory, and they managed it with solid rocket boosters. Kind of me impressed, but more just impressed that they managed to pull it off at all. Not really with how they managed to do it. So we may not be first to send a probe to the moon, but we're certainly going to do it better. Luna 1's going to take most of the year to complete, though, because unfortunately it needs a 150 ton launch vehicle to actually get it to the moon. So while we're waiting for that to be constructed, we're going to be completing a few more flights of the Puglia. This one is once again going through the Kármán line, although this time we actually have our scientific instruments turned on. Yeah, I was so preoccupied with getting Vladimir up through the Kármán line and back safely, I didn't actually think to check that I had our instruments enabled. Uh, but this time, thankfully, we do. So we get a nice return of scientific data. We don't actually get data from space low around the Earth because in realism overhaul, technically space starts at 140 kilometers. 100 kilometers is just technically very, very high up in the atmosphere, but the official definition of the Kármán line, the starting point of space is 100 kilometers. So that's the point where all the contracts and uh, and the like actually define it. This time we actually end up gliding all the way back to the space center. But as I said, we're not going to be doing a proper runway landing. Uh, we end up landing upside down, but hey, you know, any landing you walk away from, right? Moving on, we have Envoy 5. Yes, no more suborbital launches for our Moscow doggos. We're going to be launching a doggo into orbit. Now this is actually completing a contract we got to send any kind of craft up to orbital velocity and recover it. And I thought, you know what, it's a bit of a waste of an orbital class rocket just to send any old payload up to orbital velocity and return it, right? And we could have actually sent something onto a suborbital trajectory, but I thought if we're going to be building a rocket that size anyway, we might as well just send a dog all the way into orbit. But this did have very, very tight delta V margins because we're still using that XLR 11 engine that powers our hard planes as an actual third stage engine, which isn't ideal because it's not a vacuum optimized engine. We're still waiting for our 1958 orbital rocketry techno to unlock, which will give us the RD0105, which will actually be our first vacuum optimized engine. Engine. Regardless though, we managed to fire 
our third stage and get ourselves all the way into orbit without any issues. The R8 really is becoming a wonderfully reliable orbital launch vehicle and with the RD0105 engine it's actually going to be able to put some really quite heavy payloads into low earth orbit so we can just sort of keep upgrading it um, and keeping it below that 60 ton threshold so we can continue rolling it out to the 60 ton pad because rolling out anything to a larger size launch pad takes a lot longer and it also costs a lot more so if you can you sort of want to keep things um, under the different launch pad maximum weight values Regardless though, Envoy 5 is in orbit and it's going to stay there for a full 24 hours, ending up giving us a total of 40 science points, which is absolutely remarkable. Not just that, but just returning something that has actually been in orbit gives us a whole bunch of science as well. So this is going to be an incredibly lucrative mission, not just in science, but also in funds, completing that um, contract to return any kind of craft from a suborbital trajectory, well, at orbital velocity, of course, uh, is going to net us about 200,000 funds as well. So all in all, Envoy 5 is really, really important for the program so thank god it went well and it very nearly didn't go so well as it turns out uh yeah i was a little bit stingy on the reaction <laughs> control thruster propellant and we actually only just have enough to dip our periapsis within the atmosphere so we can actually return this doggo home this capsule only has um, enough electric charge to do a couple more orbits so yeah it's it's a good thing that we managed to get the periapsis as low as we did see as i said we had extremely tight delta v margins we went into a very very low orbit um, in order to get this thing up there at all so yeah the amount of reaction control propellant i could actually include was very very limited it ends up uh, that our fairing protecting the capsule burns up immediately but the rest of the <laughs> capsule thankfully remains intact and we return doggo back to the familiar planes of Russia. Yes, we have to actually be careful where we return our payloads to because we actually have a bit of a rule going with N9 that if I land something in the United States, the US gets the science from it. Yeah, that's right. If we land a payload or something that actually needs to be returned, a sample of some kind, to enemy territory, then the enemy gets their hands on it and they get the science from it which obviously is not ideal. If we land astronauts in the continental United States as well, they will be interned there. And of course, N9 will then get to decide whether or not he wants to actually return them to us. So we do need to be very careful about where we're landing to make sure we're landing in friendly territory. Regardless though, Doggo returns home a mere few hundred kilometers from the space center and we get a veritable bounty of science we unlock ourselves basic avionics and probes early flight control human rated entry descent and landing and now we have every tech except one that we need for basic capsules researching so all we have to do is research human rated materials science and then we can begin researching the very first space capsules to actually send one of our kerbals into orbit because yeah the the, <laughs> the bullia is nowhere near capable of getting to orbital velocity and i'm not sure i would trust it being able to actually handle re-entry at those kinds of velocities it can barely handle a suborbital trajectory so we're not going to push our luck in the meantime though we are just going to continue flying our relatively standard flights this one completing yet another of those supersonic flight contracts which of course the bullia is more than capable of doing. I don't really want to be doing too many of the X-Plane's high contracts because they increase their altitude by five kilometers each time and I don't really know what the maximum altitude that the half four can actually reach is. Well of course it could probably reach much much higher altitudes than it currently is. I'm more just concerned it wouldn't be able to survive the re-entry coming back so I want to sort of push it very very slowly in you know, relatively small increments um, because I don't want to go for some lofty goal like 120 kilometers and end up with the plane disintegrating on return. 
Not only would it be extremely bad because, well, the pilot would die, there's no ejection at re-entry velocities, um, but also this plane was really, really expensive. Okay, the space plane parts, not only did it take a lot of money to actually build, it took a whole year to construct this damn thing. Uh, so if it does get destroyed, we're not going to have a replacement anytime soon. Regardless though, after that flight, we finally completed the 1958 orbital rocketry technode, giving us the RD-0105 engine, a very powerful vacuum optimized upper stage, which is actually going to be really, really powerful for us over the next few years. I don't think the Yanks actually have anything equivalent to it, at least not for another year or so. So it really gives us quite a big advantage, especially with regards to lunar probes. So as I said, they may have got their first, but we're going to get there better, hopefully. Anyway, this time we did get another supersonic contract, but it turns out that uh, since the requirements were a little bit lower than some of the previous ones, we still had plenty of fuel left over. So I thought, ah, oh, you know what, we might as well just fly on up and see if we can uh, get some more high altitude science. However, I decided to swap out the reaction control fuel from high test peroxide to nitrous oxide, since it's a little bit more efficient, gives us a bit of a larger delta V margin. Unfortunately, though, uh, I was a little bit stingy when I was actually putting the nitrous oxide on the aircraft. I didn't quite realize how much I should actually put on since we haven't used this before. And we run out of reaction control fuel. Um, I was having a little bit of a panic right now because in the upper part of the atmosphere, we have no way of controlling the aircraft whatsoever. I tried firing the engines. I maybe should have tried firing just one of the engines uh, to try and bring the nose up. Um, but I had a little bit of a panic attack. But thankfully, I whacked the control surfaces up to their maximum deflection. And as we entered the upper parts of the atmosphere, we were able to regain control of the aircraft. Because if you enter the atmosphere at too steep an angle of attack in the pulia, then you're really really risking burning the aircraft up. Is it an aircraft anymore? I guess it's just a space, it's a spacecraft, isn't it? It's a space plane, it's a space plane is what it is. But thankfully we managed to return unscathed. So a little bit of a scare. Uh, I put more nitrous oxide in next time and I've got a bit more of an idea of how much nitrous oxide we need because of course all the different resources are at different densities and regardless, so you need more or less of some than others. The Americans, as I said, though, have been busy. Not only have they launched yet another low Earth orbit satellite, but they've actually launched another probe to the moon in September. However, it didn't actually reach the moon. It passed nearby, uh, but it's now just in a highly eccentric orbit around the Earth. So they haven't actually managed to impact the moon again, and they haven't got anything into orbit yet. So that's where Luna 1 comes in. It sat atop the massive 150-ton R-10 rocket, which I actually developed for the Envoy 5 mission because Kerbal Engineer was giving me really, really wrong Delta V readouts, which is why we swapped over to MechJeb. We're not doing the automatic ascent guidance, just so you know. We're only using MechJeb for the Delta V readouts and once we unlock the early flight control we're actually going to be able to use the smart ASS. We decided to lock it behind uh, a tech node since N9 was begging me to be able to. But regardless with our new mighty rocket in hand we are going to send our first probe to the moon. We have to wait until the optimum launch window when our inclination relative to the moon is at its lowest point and when the moon is approaching the ascending node. We only actually get one chance to launch to the moon every month. But unfortunately, we're using the RD-107 booster engines for the first time and one fails immediately. I mean a split second before I release the launch clamps and the entire probe is completely destroyed. Yeah, um... I mean, it was a bit hit or miss whether or not it would reach lunar orbit, since every stage had to perform perfectly. I thought it would be able to get off the pad. Um, apparently no. So that is a major setback for our space program. It's going to take almost another year to build Luna 2. Although with the RD-0105 engine and the basic avionics and probes we just unlocked, it is going to be a much more capable spacecraft. But still, I think the Americans are now in with a serious chance of beating us to lunar orbit. Regardless though, we're going to approach the end of the year and do our first orbital rocket launch from Placets. Yes, I've decided that Baikonur can now take over the lunar program and Placets can now focus on our 
pretty standard um, and reliable orbital rockets uh, just for low Earth orbit. So this is actually launching Pogoda 1, which is a weather satellite, and that's not sort of a euphemism for a spy satellite. No, it is launching a genuine weather satellite that we have a contract for. We just have to launch a small satellite into a 300 kilometer circular orbit with 20 units of weather payload. I mean, I was I was kind of raging at this point, so it was nice to just have a nice little routine mission to launch from Pesetsk. Uh, Pesetsk is actually a really, really useful launch site because it has such a high latitude. It is going to be very useful for accessing high inclination and polar orbit. Bits. Uh, so, you know, we may well use it for launching some spy sets in the next episode, but this this isn't a spy set, honestly. I sent to N9, I, we have a little drive thing where we keep track of all the orbital spacecraft and we can splice them into each other's save files, and I wrote weather satellite, and he goes, ah, yeah, weather satellite, I see it. I, <laughs> like, it, it literally is, it is a weather satellite. Regardless, though, we have quite specific orbital parameters, so I did actually stick some reaction control thrusters onto this, just some very basic forward, backwards uh, translation controls just so we could adjust our orbital height. But our kick stage actually manages to deliver the satellite into a perfectly circular orbit. Although for some reason the contract glitched out and said that we didn't have 20 units of WeatherSat payload on board, it still completed the contract. Um, so regardless, we managed to get Pogoda 1 into a nice stable orbit and we get a beautiful view of the land down below. In the next episode though, we really are going to have to launch some communication satellites because uh, we have a lot of black spots in ground station coverage, which is the reason why we only have one transfer window to the moon. If we try to launch to the moon at the descending node, then we actually um, lose contact around the other side of the Earth because there are no ground stations in the Pacific. Regardless though, we're closing off the year with one final flight of the Puglia, and some of you might have noticed Vladimir isn't flying. No, we have spent 50,000 funds hiring a new cosmonaut, Valentina Kerman, part of a new class of cosmonaut, and she is going to be the first woman in space, proving the superiority of the communist system, equality for all, even though she is flying like about a year after Vladimir, but she's a new astronaut. It's fine. Not astronaut, cosmonaut. I do need to actually <laughs> think to myself, no, cosmonaut. I'm going to say astronaut and cosmonaut interchangeably though, um, because I mean, the complex that the KSC is still called the astronaut complex, even though of course we are playing as the Soviets, so they're called cosmonauts. Thing is, you know, cosmonaut technically came first. It was just the US wanting to be different. So they decided to come up with the term astronaut and then a bunch of different countries decided to also adopt that term but uh, you got some terms for different countries as well like I believe China it's Taikonaut uh, which is kind of cool so I honestly I'm all for all the different countries have their own terms for their own uh, spacefaring people regardless though this is actually going higher than any Puglia flight has previously gone in order to achieve one or well, X planes, high contracts. So just to be on the safe side, I decided to do a retrograde burn just to slow some of our velocity um, and make sure that we don't burn up upon re-entry. And actually using this kind of maneuver, which Valentina here has actually pioneered, we might be able to go much, much higher in the next episode. So I'm thinking in 1958, we may well do a pretty much vertical ascent profile, get to a really high altitude and then do a retrograde burn before we enter the atmosphere. And that will actually enable us to hopefully safely reach much, much higher altitudes than we did this year. But regardless, Valentina manages to touch down safely, although she doesn't manage to make it all the way back to the space center. I did kind of misjudge it since they didn't take the retrograde burn into account, but the recovery crew finds her in good spirits standing outside her trusty Puglia space plane. But that is the end of the episode. Thank you very much for watching everyone. I do hope you've enjoyed. Be sure to check out N9's video linked in the end screen to see what those pesky Americans have been up to, and I will see you all next time.